in a soloist spot, but I'm not the soloist. Uh, it, was nice, it was nice of them to do that for me, since uh, yeah, usually I've practiced a little more before I step out and stand in this particular spot. Um, good evening, my name is Martin Risley. I'm, I'm a New Zealander, originally, and uh, I'm getting, uh, it's my privilege to talk a little bit about the specificness of, of specific, specificity, or this, yeah, what the, the, the difference that we'll hear now, as opposed to earlier in the competition, the solo works you had, the, the modern solo work, and the works with piano, the chamber works, the virtuoso works, and then the chamber works. And now, now you're gonna hear the, the three finalists with orchestra, and what, what, what sort of difference does that mean in terms of how they will approach their instrument? Well, one of the things is right where I'm standing, the spot, it's the best place to be on the stage in terms of sound. It's ideally supposed to be in most halls and there's usually something right above you. This hall doesn't need it because it has this ideal shape and it's, it's a very beautiful acoustic. Um, but you wanna be somewhere where you can be heard because, because of what's behind you. Um, fairly large orchestras, um, especially tonight with the Brahms and the Sibelius and the Tchaikovsky as well, so it's slightly lighter actually, the orchestration in the Tchaikovsky. You wouldn't imagine, would you? But <laughs> the heaviest one of them all would be the Brahms in terms of um, the orchestra scoring. So you want the, the, the violinist has to be in a, in a very advantageous position and also well enough to be able to see the conductor and work, and work with that um, very, very key person. Now, the reason I'm talking about this, I, well, uh, there's not really a reason, but um, I do have some background in competitions. When I was 18, I think I did my first uh, international one when I went to the Yehudi Minimum competition and, and, and it was in um, Folkestone, England at the time. Now it takes place in a, a different city every, every competition. And uh, I went back there again when I was 20. And that time I got to the semi-finals, which was nice. And I mean, I was, um, in the meantime, I'd also gone over to the Portsmouth String Quartet competition when I was 19. And that was a different kind of competition with string quartets, and we got to those semifinals as well. And then um, the last, the last international competition I did was the um, Lexus a few, couple of years later when I was about 21, and I got to the semifinals of that as well. But never made the finals of the international ones. After that, I sort of concentrated on getting jobs and those sorts of competitions because auditions and and auditions for jobs are basically also international competitions and they're a whole different set of repertoire and things. But, so I, I, I did a few of them and um, basically it didn't matter that, for, for me, it didn't matter that I didn't win or didn't, you know, any of those things because what I got out of them was incredible. Um, having come from New Zealand when I was 18 and being one of about 24 violinists from all over the world and seeing what everyone else was doing and meeting them and then hearing about their teachers and, and seeing what they're all doing was one of the most important things that sort of guided me in my future. And that's what kept me coming back, you know, every year or basically every year I'd do something. Um, and, and I would just learn so much from those experiences. And so I think everyone who's, everyone who's come to this competition, they're all incredibly accomplished individuals and they've all got different things out of being here, not just being in a beautiful city of Queenstown and and all that sort of stuff, but um, just having, having heard everyone else in the competition and done all those, um, and even perhaps after the competition, you know, learning from some of the jury members and getting their comments and that sort of thing is so, so vital in, in building and connecting generations of musicians that, that um, as difficult and, and stressful as they are for the performers, they're incredibly valuable and great privilege to, to be involved in. So the main thing about the difference that we're here tonight is that, as I said before, we've got this big orchestra with us. It's not a piano this time or a small, small chamber group. How does the violin stand out? Well, one of the, one of the things is where. <laughs> if you put the violin at the back, behind the timpanis, it's gonna sound pretty distant. So that's, that's one of the things. And the, my other thing is basically the analogy of a, of a driving car. Most of us know how to drive a car, but how many of us know how to drive a race car? Right, I'd love to know, but I don't have the money or the health insurance or nobody would let me. <laughs> My kids certainly wouldn't. But um, as fun as it would be, it would also be an incredibly different skills, right? It's not like driving a normal car. And 
and and to, to basically to to take the violin to its maximum and push out the the most the best and most brilliant sound you can when you need to is is like driving that car very quickly without any room for error and it's going to skid and just fall off it's almost almost to the point where it's that's what race race drivers do they almost lose control but they, they know exactly when to stop just before the end. And it's very similar to what we do with the bow. Because, you know, anybody just playing the violin on their own, they might, they might just um, sit in a very, a very uh, loose part of the, of the string. As you're as you trying to get more and more brilliance, you get closer and closer to this thing called the bridge. And, and that calls out, as my partner was calling it earlier, this. Um, bow noise that you hear close up but you don't tend to hear in, in the concert halls. Perlman talks about it a lot and he's, he's famous for having a great huge sound. One of the problems though that's making us happen to drive the night race cars are recordings because more than a hundred years ago there weren't so many recordings and then suddenly everybody was making records and they were putting the soloists with microphones right there and people would listen to this this recording and say, whoa, wow, that, that's what I must be able to hear when I go to the concert hall and I hear a violinist play. But he either needs a microphone <laughs> right, right next to him or he's gonna be pumping out extra gas. And, and that's what has sort of led to um, the increase, I think, in, in volume of modern soloists. And Mr. Perlman is one of those ones, if you go to hear him play, you can be in a massive, in a very, not a very good concert hall, but it can be massive and you still, you still hear him like he's right there. And that's the sort of projection. He's you know, one of those people able to do that. And he's driving the race car all the time to the maximum speed. And just, you know, when everything's almost skidding off. When I say skidding off, I mean into an ugly sound, where they're <laughs> anything like that. And it's not happening um, because he's, he's got everything worked out to get to that point. So, um, yeah, so if I took even just a simple note and I increase, and I increase the, um, not so much the volume, but just the, the intensity of the sound. And if I go too far like that, it starts to get scratchy, like that, but if I go... That'll be a sort of running track for, for most of the piece if you need to be heard. And you'll only be able to play really softly with an orchestra. Well, this hall's pretty nice. You might be able to do all kinds of things in here. But um, not all halls are like this. <laughs> and a soloist has to be prepared for anything. Um, so that's one of the things. You've got to play close to the bridge. And you've got to use as much hair as possible, which also um, creates more uh, chances for error. And the other thing you'll have to do is use vibrato. Vibrato is, is generally another way of energizing sound and making it um, more brilliant. So if you could take a, just that same note, if I, and I don't have any vibrato on it, and I add, then there's suddenly a little bit more resonance further in the hall, um, just from that, the changing of the air amplitude of the, of, the, of the pitch up and down. And that sort of thing is very common. Opera singers, that's how, how they get their sound out is by having, you know, this tremendous vibrato. Um, whether you like it or not, this is somewhere how they predict. Can you imagine in Wagner, you know, the soloist having no vibrato whatsoever? Um, so as, as, a, as a tool, it's, it's very useful. Um, doesn't mean that you always have to vibrate, and there can be times where you can play very softly as a soloist, and even without vibrato. And the Shostak, Shostakovich concerto always struck would do that all the time. But, um, but as a general rule, that's one of our, our big tools. So, so those involve both hands, the, the bridge and the, and, oh, and the bow. I, I seem to have solved the problem of what, what to do with my hands when I'm talking by putting an instrument in it. But it's, I, I, I swear it is my instrument. I didn't just pick it up off the back randomly. Hope that nobody will notice. <laughs> um, and then, how do you prepare for this for this event anyway? First of all, most soloists are expected to come out and play from memory, and I'm pretty sure everyone will be tonight. You've probably heard a lot of that in the earlier stages. You don't usually do the chamber music from memory, right? Because you're with a bunch of, with a group of four or five people. Um, 
And what you'll usually not see is the conductor do a concerto from memory. They can do it, they can often know it from memory, but it would make, usually makes the soloist really nervous <laughs> if the conductor decides to do it from memory. It's like, okay, I've got it from memory. If I mess up, who's gonna help me? You know, so, um, but I mean, that does create a little more anxiety for the performer, I'm, you know. It's not a matter of a little bit more, it's quite a lot more. Because when you're standing here, and you're ready to play, and there's, no, <laughs> there's nothing in front of you, it's, it's a lot, it can be a lot more um, um, disconcerting than if you've got this sort of thing to focus on with the music. But what the music does is get in the way. That's, that's the point. That's the reason we don't want to have it there. It becomes a sort of a trap between you and the audience. So by removing that music, hopefully the, 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 the soloist is able to reach you directly and it's also looks much more impressive and all of that stuff. But so the, the soloist has to prepare, prepare it from memory, but in a way that they can adapt to all of the things that they may be having to deal with in terms of the acoustic, in terms of the conductor, in terms of the orchestra. And you have one rehearsal to deal with that. Not usually a whole rehearsal. In my experience, you know, you're very lucky if you get a whole rehearsal, but you might get a one and a half, one and a half hours two hours maximum um, to work through. And a piece like the Brahms is already 50 minutes long. So there's not a lot of time to do things twice. You can't, you wouldn't just play the piece through twice necessarily. Um, and you've got to stop and discuss things. And so you have to have an idea in your head how you're gonna um, address the points that you want to address. And, and usually I'll spend a lot of that time in that rehearsal listening more than anything to the orchestra and seeing how they're playing it and make sure that if, if we're sort of doing things similarly so that when you actually come to playing it yourself, you're not having to worry too much about, you don't have to worry about them anyway, but in terms of, of doing similar things or different things to the orchestra, um, it's, it's really, that's the time when you want to be able to concentrate on what they're doing is in the rehearsal. Um, so your part has to be just there and and you, you don't want to have to think about it too much when you're playing it in the rehearsal. You're going to be thinking about all the other things that, that could be happening. And, and the, the, the key point in that whole thing is your conductor. And uh, you're meeting, usually have a meeting with him before the rehearsal just to save a little bit of that time. I'm reminded of a fa famous occasion with uh, Yehudi Menuhin when he was 15, some ridiculous age, when he made this incredible recording of the Elgar Concerto with Elgar. And he came to this rehearsal and he wanted to play it for the great composer. And he expected, you know, that they would have some time together. And, and uh, I think he played about half a movement. And Algar's like, that's, that's lovely. Okay, I'm off to the races now. <laughs> and then, dear boy, it's going to be lovely. I'll see you at the, at the recording session. And <laughs> so Menuhin was a little put out that he was less important than the horse races. But, um, he, you know, he, <laughs> he did want to, to learn something from the great man, but I think the great man was, was sufficiently impressed that he was like, there's nothing he could really tell this young lad. And so they just, they made this great recording together and it was all fine. But, um, so sometimes those rehearsals are very quick. Sometimes they're, they're very useful. I've had experiences with some conductors asking me to do things different musically, but right in that rehearsal the day before a concert which when you consider the soloist may have been rehearsing it for weeks or even months um, and suddenly change it the day before the concert, the whole con the concept is quite a, it can be, you know, some people it can be quite disconcerting. Um, the, con the conductor who asked that of me once was Yannick Neger Seguin, who's a, who, this was before he became big conductor of the Met and the Phil Philadelphia Orchestra. We did the Mendelssohn Concerto together a bunch of years ago. And he's like, oh, then nobody ever does this crescendo on the first page. Can you do this? Yeah. And I hadn't realized that there were these, these things he'd been thinking about in the part. And when a conductor has been looking at the part and, and thinking about it like that, you've got to respect that and, and take it on board and, and you know, decide one way or another. Because quite often you will have spent a lot of time with the concerto and the conductor will be last minute huffing and puffing coming here and they've got so much to do and you just sort of you know, work with them and tell them what you want. But if they kind of bring something to the, to the table as well, I think it's a great, it's a great sort of collaboration and something that you can get out of it. Um, so that does happen as well. But there has to be some agreement. There was a famous version with 
of Brahms' first piano concerto of it. I don't know if you probably all heard about that, um, where Nina Bernstein completely disagreed with uh, Glenn Gould's interpretation, which was colossally slow. And you know, Bernstein being a man of flesh and, and speed and, and moving, um, he was totally against how slow it was. And so we actually said to the audience at the concert in the New York Philharmonic that we're about to play this, but I, I disagree with the, <laughs> the interpretation, <laughs> which was, was very, uh, yeah, strange thing to happen in a concert, I have to say. There has to be some kind of, you know, agreement and, and uh, collaboration that happens. And usually it does. That's just a really weird exception that between two, two people who just did not see eye to eye but still were playing together. Um, and it's still actually a really nice recording if you listen to it. <laughs> it's just very, very slow. But some or it, it also depends on what the orchestra's like. Some of them are like uh, trucks, very big trucks. And some of them have like lots of articulations on the back. So you can imagine turning a corner, the more articulations, the longer it takes for all of those bits at the back, right, to switch, to switch gears. And the bit, usually the better the orchestra, the more like a tight ship it is. And a very, very um, good orchestra is incredibly fast to adapt. And they usually know how to do that through section leaders and just very tiny, tiny signals. But um, all orchestras are different. And uh, that's something you don't know and unless you've worked with the orchestra before. Even if you have, for not for a few years, they might have changed personnel, they might have changed their culture a little bit. So you just get to know them during that rehearsal as well. And you get a feel of what, what you can get away with and what you can't. One orchestra I was in, um, it was, it's just the way it played. It, it would not allow the soloists to kind of run away and do, do fancy, fancy fooling around in certain beats. So, whereas a lot of the time when I was in my orchestra, if I was a concertmaster, and you would think, you would, you, would, you would know the solo part and you would see that the soloist has done something, so you'd quickly go with them and the conductor would be there and you'd know there would be. But you wouldn't think to ignore the soloist and just follow the conductor and hope the conductor noticed what the soloist is doing. But this orchestra would do that. And, and, uh, and it, didn't, it didn't suffer any kind of um, um, rhythmic pulling around. So it was like the truck with endless, endless articulations that never would quite catch up. And I was astonished because it was a very good orchestra too. But it's just, that was actually their culture. They was like, no, no I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they're going to train the soloists. That's how they, they sort of thought of it, I think. Um, but yeah, hope, I think they're more in the rarity. But orchestras do have their own personalities and they're all different. And so people going around playing with orchestras um, will, will have to be very adaptable. And you'll have seen that already in the competition, how adaptable these players are and have to be in the music world. And um, this, this part here, where they get to sort of be at the front and as a soloist, uh, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful experience and, and a great privilege for anyone who gets up to and play these great pieces. Um, but it's not enough to just be able to be mastering to do that in, in any kind of career anymore. Um, which is fine because being a musician is about music and all the different things you can do with it, not just one kind of thing. Um, so let's talk about the actual concertos we're hearing, which are all in D, and I'm sorry about that, but it happens to be one of the most popular keys for this instrument. Um, I suppose because um, the bottom string is sometimes used, but not so much frequently, that's the G, but the D is just, just right there in the, at the heart of the instrument, and, and, the, and the strings around it are the functional dominance and subdominance, and it all just works very nicely. And so a lot of composers have, have, have chosen those keys, and this key, uh, that key, D major, D minor, um, because it's worked very well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really cool concertos in the 20th century you haven't seen on the competition, which would be nice to see some more Bartok and Stravinsky and, and even later things up to Clarigliano, people like that. But, but really, could you blame them for not wanting to play Brahms? Concerto was so fantastic, and the Tchaikovsky is amazing, and Sibelius. I mean, so uh, it's it's 
it's hard. And, and also audiences want to hear those pieces generally and probably more than some of those other ones. Bartok is very tricky to put together with orchestra anyway. So as a competition piece, it might be very, very difficult. Um, so the Brahms, is, the Brahms is our one German offering. And as such, it's, it, it does owe a lot to its forebears, to his forebears, the Beethoven Concerto, of course. Um, there are lots of things that are modeled on that. You can think just like at the very, the, the very end of the Beethoven where the violin gets soft. And then cha-cha! Well, the Brahms does the same thing at the very end of the concerto where the soloist gets softer and softer, except he goes down. And he just goes down and soft, soft, soft. And then the orchestra goes bang! <laughs> There's a very, very similar end. Um, but Brahms didn't profess to love the Beethoven concerto as much as he loved some other concertos that, that um, people don't think about much these days. <laughs> um, like Viotti. Viotti? Yeah. <laughs> he liked the Viotti concertos. Anyway, um, so the Beethoven concerto was a very big influence, and also the works of solo works of Bach and um, Joachim, who this concerto was written very collaboratively with, was one of the early big players of the solo Bach repertory, and that involved a lot of hello Andrew, <laughs> a lot of double stops and, and multi multiphonic playing, and you get that in the concerto as well, in a different way than you do in the Tchaikovsky and Sibelius. You'll actually get part writing that's um, a bit more like Bach. At the very end, those chords, you, know, you, you get all that stuff, uh, it kind of comes out as a, as a big moment, and that's Bach. And also in the first movement, um, when it, the orchestra's doing its very cool um, every, uh, melody, and then violin is... Uh, there's a very Bachian kind of figuration in the violin part. But then there's also lots of these chords um, that, that make the melody. And ba Brahms also was the first person that I know of to make the piano version of the Chaconne, the Bach Chaconne, which was one of the most famous Bach solo pieces. And he made a transcription for piano, which actually sounds very similar to the violin version. But um, and then in his concerto, one of the melodies, the melodic parts, right? Um, it's basically the, the Chaconne begins. With the same chords, and Brahms uses Brahms uses those chords in, in this concerto to great effect. I mean, he has a whole a whole three sections playing those those harmonies, and then he has the soloist on his own, right, doing those chords on his own, and it only works because it's in D major or D minor, sorry, because of the open strings and stuff. But and it's also kind of uh, connected to the second symphony, and a lot of the rhythms and the moods. Um, it begins with that melody low down in the, in the cellos. And the second symphony also begins low down. All right, and that same, almost the same kind of relaxed speed. And then when we get to the um, second subject material, there's another similarity with the... Um, those dotted rhythms. Very similar kind of dotted excitement happens. It's similar in the second symphony. Um, but what's really cool about this symphony, uh, this violin concerto, is, is it has the very best opening that any of us can can experience. Um, it's like a tornado, right? The, wind, the whole thing winds up, and the soloist comes in in the middle of this. It's like a just a tornado going around like this, and it, Part goes around and the, and the soloist is stuck in it. You'll see him stuck for ages and ages and ages and ages and ages and ages, and finally comes out of it um, to this angelic melody, which is done up very high, which again is similar to the Beethoven. In the Beethoven concerto, it's not such a tornado; it's a completely different kind of aesthetic. But he also starts at the bottom, to the, goes up the instrument, and then he comes down again. And in order to get to the theme. He takes us down, down to the bottom of the instrument. And then he ends up very high, and then the melody stays up there. So, and, that, and Brahms sort of does that, but he does it over a much bigger 
time span. And he goes up and down and up and down and you get caught in that. But it has the same sort of idea. What was that? <laughs> okay. So, so there's a lot of influence of Beethoven and Brahms in this concerto. Um, and in the, in the other concertos, Tchaikovsky, you don't find really any Bach, and you don't find any Beethoven. You find something very original and a little bit more folky, folk, um, and it, it, a beautiful sort of switch between what is elegant and what is sort of more rough and ruvido. There's lots of gutsy stuff in the Tchaikovsky as well as beautiful um, and elegant parts. And when he takes those things like triple stops, like those chords like I was playing in, in, in the Brahms, where when Tchaikovsky does it, he takes chords like this, and he makes them a kind of a, a big fiddle kind of cut up and forth, and he, and he makes these passages. And they, and they get very exciting, and they, you lose hairs. <laughs> and, and it's really cool writing that he does, but it's, it's more for energy and effect. Um, than it is in Bra like in Brahms where it's about the melodic line. So it's a completely different way that he approaches it. And it's been incredibly successful. It's been one of the most popular violin concertos ever since it's written, despite being panned by the critics. Um, the original slow movement is, it still exists. And it, actually, you won't hear it tonight, but it, the tune goes... It's a very beautiful woodwind part under that, um, and, it, and it's a very nice piece. But if you listen to it now and you, and you think putting it in the concerto, it doesn't quite fit as well as the new one does because the first movement is so big and so complex that it needs sort of a breather, and that's what the second movement of this concerto is so soft. The violinist has a mute on, and and it, it becomes more intense as it goes through. But it's a really amazing foil to that first movement which then prepares you for this crazy, crazy kind of peasant dance of the last movement, which is really fun and just builds and builds and builds. And I would say this is a typical aspect there of, that you find in other Russian works from later on, Kachaturian and people like that too, of great stamina in their soloists. You know, they're, they're trained their soloists very, <laughs> very tough and very strong there in Russia. And, they can play, and they can play, and they can play, and, and it goes on and on and on, and you think, oh my God, can they do it anymore? And, and it's, it's, it's still, it's, it, it sort of builds up in pressure. There's also been a lot of people cutting and messing around with this concerto for, for a number of years. The first person it was written for, Leopold Auer, made a bunch of alterations and changes to it, some of which have stuck with some people, but we're now getting back to the original, thank goodness, because it's beautiful and it was written in, a, in an amazing way, very original way. And the, the last movement was the most butchered because it was cut up. It was almost about a third of it was chopped out. And most of the recordings you hear up, even up to 1970, are the cut version. And I can't listen to that old version anymore now that I, I mean, I grew up wanting to play the full version and it was rare in its time, but I think pretty much everybody does it now. I will see what happens tonight. I don't know. I'll be interested to see. But um, the, I think the full version is just a real, it's got a bit more of that stamina and in this and will they fall over kind of feel to it. But, but it, it does have a kind of mountain excitement. If you've ever seen Cossack dances, you know, the, <laughs> the legs are going up and down and it doesn't stop. And there's a bit of Cossack in their, in their last movement, which is, that's really fun. Yeah, we're very lucky to have that for this instrument as well. And then we come to Sibelius. Ah, what to say about that. Uh, he was a man who became a great composer, uh, but it, what I think left poison in his heart was the fact that the violin didn't go the way he wanted. He wanted to be a solo violinist, and it didn't happen, and he was really cut up about it. <laughs> he took it out on us in this piece. Um, but at the same time, he crafted something so amazing so, I mean, if it wasn't such a great piece, people would be like, ah, oh, I'm not going to learn that. You know, there are difficult concertos out there that people just don't play because they don't like the piece enough and they're so difficult. Schoenberg is one of them that not many people play it. Don't know if it will ever find its, um, you know, audience, but it's a very, very difficult concerto. But this, this Sibelius, it's full of little traps 
little details that just make life really miserable for the soloist. <laughs> and, um, and there are traps even for the conductor as well. And there's one I was going to point out for you to watch out for. The, there's a very exciting passage that happens in, in the orchestra alone. And then it's repeated again at the end of the first movement with the soloist doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and but there's one, one pattern that the, the soloist has to play. And then they add an accents later on. Those accents, they really throw off the conductor <laughs> if you do them. And so, we'll see if the soloist tonight does them, but what I often, always invariably the conductor feels that you must be speeding up because of what they're hearing. And I'm like, no, I'm just trying to play with you guys. Just ignore me, please. That's what I said. <laughs> and, um, and that's one, one place that, ah, oh, conductors get really nervous and they have to have like sort of iron, iron wheels to keep the, keep the tempo from going because they, if they hear you speeding up, a lot of them want to, want to be sympathetic to you. And it's like, no, I'm not speeding up. That's just the way it's written. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trap, yeah. And and the last movement is full of traps, but it's so exciting. It's and when it's pulled off, it's one of the one of the great, one of the great movements, um, in a different way from the way that the Brahms is, is so exciting. But it has this uh, ostinato in the in the in the timpani, yum, and it just goes and it goes and it goes, and everything happens above that. And the soloist has all these challenges thrown in, or her, and you have to hurdle them within this yum, bum, 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 because that's not going to wait for you. And he, he, in Sibelius, he puts these things where he gets you right up here, at the very top of the instrument, and then back to there with absolutely no time. And at the same time, you've got this timpani going. And you have to find solutions for how to do that. And, uh, but I've, I've investigated, there's, some, there's a few connections in this movement with Vinyavsky because he was a violinist, and Vinyavsky was a great violinist and wrote a bunch of studies and concertos. Um, his first concerto, which is famously difficult, the, the theme of the last movement goes... That sort, of, that sort of dotted rhythm, but it's done very lightly. And Sibelius takes that bowing, and he makes it, makes it very heavy in the, in the lower register. Right, that has to be and it dug out of the instrument um, with great energy and each of those little strokes has to be released at the same time if it doesn't release <laughs> you get that and so those quick notes that you hear they're all kind of about three different movements each they're not just one one movement to make them sound so they're incredibly hard to do and um, so that, that's one thing, he took the Vinyaski idea and made it harder. Thank you, Sibelius, thank you for that. Um, and then there's another, there's a famous study, Vinyaski in D major. And it ends with these runs. And that's the end of the piece. And then the third movement of Sibelius, the exact same notes up to a point. Um, And then it changes. But those exact same scales are taken out of the Vinyavsky piece and put into the Sibelius. So I, I think whether it consciously or not, it was in his mind. You know, it was Vinyavsky. I hate Vinyavsky. I hate Vinyavsky. I'm going to do this to these guys. And he just threw, it, threw his things, mixed them all up and threw them in there. Another thing he did right after that bit is the scale in thirds. Um, it's in staccato. So it, and it's done much faster than that, um, and each note has to be articulated. And that comes out of another Vinyavsky piece, this famous... Um, and then it has a bunch of thirds in it as well that go... And that's a very hard piece, and possibly he, he thought, okay, I'll throw that one in as well. <laughs> I'll throw that into my concerto on top of it. But, um, but despite all those difficulties he threw in there, the main thing about this Sibelius concerto, which is so amazing, it's really a symphony. It's one of his best symphonies, if not the best symphony that he wrote. I know people love two and five and they're fantastic, but this is 
really should be like in one, another one of the symphonies because it's a really fully symphonic work and the, and the solo part, as intricate as it is and as difficult, it is merely one part of an incredibly massive web that he has woven and full of this um, very strange but brooding expression and uh, Nordic folk tales and imagery and fantastic, fantastic beasts in the last movement. So it all comes together in an incredible way, but it's, it's, it's a great challenge. They're all big challenges for each of these individuals because they're very long, long pieces and they, the violin plays almost all the time in every, every one of them, except the beginning of the Brahms, but once he gets going, that's it, <laughs> no vacation. Um, one, one more thing about the Brahms was that the beautiful slow movement melody that you hear in the oboe, it is so gorgeous. Um, you couldn't imagine it done with it any other way. And the violin, when it plays it, it embellishes it and does different, takes it somewhere else, which we all know and love now. But when Sarazati was asked to play it, he said, no, I'm not going to play this piece. The, the only mel nice melody, I don't even get to play it. <laughs> so there's a slightly more egotistical view of how he thought of the concertos. But, but yeah, the concerto was moving into a more collaborative and symphonic area with all of these pieces, really, and, and you'll hear that tonight. Um, and you'll also hear them driving their cars very hard <laughs> in the dangerous spots, really close to the bridge a lot of the time, and where, where life is very difficult, but that's, that's the only way to make the kind of sound that they're going to need to make here, um, to get across to the people right at the very back of the hall and get over the whole French horns and timpanis and all the rest of it. So I think that's all I have to say today, but um, I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to go out and enjoy it now. I'm going to rest and Who's enjoy the concert. Which? Sorry? Who's playing which? Who's playing which? You're asking me. I only got that memo yesterday. I can tell you. Uh, I know that Benjamin Baker, New Zealand boy, yeah, is playing the Brahms. And um, I don't want to get the names wrong. So... Um, Playing the Sibelius, we have Luke Hsu, H-S-U, from the USA. And playing the Tchaikovsky from Romania, I can't I don't know how to pronounce her name. Ioana Cristina? Goetia, Ioana Goetia. So I'm look, looking forward to that. It'll be fantastic. They'll, they will be here very soon. So <laughs> well, enjoy. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 